All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I'm your host. In this episode, we're going to talk about confusion and clarity in the church in regards to the LGBTQ issues and much of what we're seeing happening here in our day and age uh, within the church. We're going to have to learn to walk the edge of the sword. I do want to say before we get into this, be sure to go to isaiahinstitute.com and get the free weekly newsletter that gives you insights into the meaning of the book of Isaiah, which then in turn informs you as to the meaning of the Book of Mormon. And the Isaiah Institute helps you understand this book. Also, you receive the Isaiah Institute translation of the Book of Isaiah, completely free. Go to isaiahinstitute.com backslash subscribe. First off, Jacob Hansen of Thoughtful Faith put out a video today very much articulating the confusion that many members of the church have. I want to add some additional clarity, I believe, to what he is saying and what is happening and what isn't happening in regards to these very confusing issues. There seems to be many mixed signals coming from Salt Lake, where we have a specific message from the pulpit, and yet it seems at times in practice something completely different is happening. So let's cover the confusion first, and then let's move ourselves back to some clarity here. First, because of some of the things that are happening, many people believe that this is simply a road being paved toward same-sex marriage in the temple. That's the big thing. It is hoped for by some members. Some people put their hope in this change instead of their hope in Christ. And others are just very fearful that that might be where we're going. And somehow everything that we've been taught in terms of the doctrine of the family, which is part of the doctrine of Christ, and everything we go through in the temple is somehow going to unravel. I had an interview uh, a year or two ago with scholar Patrick Mason, and he kind of gave the example of concentric circles of doctrine, whereas on the outside edges of these concentric circles, there are doctrines that are kind of iffy and they can be changed. And as you move closer and closer to the center of these these circles, you end up with eternal truths that cannot change. And there is the implication that same-sex marriage in the temple is one of these concentric circles that is more toward the outside that is something that could change. But I would completely disagree with that. I mean, where do you go from there? I mean, after that, we get to what? The atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and faith and repentance in that sacrifice? Is that a core eternal truth? Are there any core eternal truths? We have a large change in our culture right now. We have a new ideology that is spreading like a brush fire throughout the United States and many parts of the West. With Gen Z, one of four individuals now identifies as non-binary. Right in Utah, the Salt Lake Tribune has an article out today saying that Utah has a growing demand for gender-affirming care as lawmakers consider anti-LGBTQ bills. This is front and center. We need to understand that as a church, We are human beings that are products to some degree of our culture. That culture is changing. We recently highlighted the new managing director of communications with the church who has advocated for same-sex marriage and the pride movement. We've talked a lot about what Deseret Book has been doing in the books that they sell and the support that they seem to give to those that are advocating for the pride movement. Again, this is not about loving someone who is LGBTQ. That's not the point. This is about ideology. This is about things that are unraveling. This is about President Nelson's identity hierarchy, where we are in this new ideology, lifting these other identities way above the importance of being a child of God, a child of the covenant, and a disciple of Christ. This week in Come Follow Me, On LDS.org, we have the Rainbow Tree of Life, 
Now, again, I need to be very clear. I have spoken to the artist on this. She says that this has zero intention of being a pride tree of life. This exact image is being used all over social media by those who advocate for the pride movement. This here is one of many, many examples found throughout social media. So again, does this all pave the way for the church to open up same-sex marriage in the temple? Like Jacob from Thoughtful Faith, I'm going to take a clip here from Ward Radio podcast. Is gay marriage on the table? It is a genuine question. I, I proposed a question on Twitter. People got mad at me for asking, but it's very relevant to what's happening today. If this is the future and this is the direction the church has said, hey, in 20 years, we're going to be a we're going to be a church that allows gay marriage. All right. So this is an inevitable question that people are going to have. And, and that's where all this confusion comes from. How solid is the doctrine of the family? And I think we need to look at a few things here. First of all, let me say something. It is not going to happen. That change will not happen. That is a core central doctrine of the gospel. And what we really need to focus on is the words of the prophets and the scriptures. Listen to the general conference talks and the apostles and see how clear they are on this. Let's go to some of this clarity right now. Back in November of 2022, President Oaks especially was talking about the Respect for Marriage Act and helping to support it passed. That's already confusing. But with that, right, here is the release from the church on November 15th, 2022. Very blatant. It says, The doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints related to marriage between a man and a woman is well known and will remain unchanged. A month later, when the RFMA was signed, the church came out with another statement and says here, as restated last month, the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints related to marriage between a man and a woman is well known and will remain unchanged. So while these other things are going on, causing confusion, and they do cause confusion, that's a natural reaction. It's okay. There is a consistent message from the brethren over the pulpit and beyond about marriage being between a man and a woman. Just last October in General Conference, three different times by three different members of the 15, including the prophet, mentioned marriage between a man and a woman in the doctrine of the family. Listen to what they say. This is Elder Christofferson. He states, the highest and holiest manifestation of the sealing power is in the eternal union of a man and a woman in marriage and the linking of humankind through all generations. And he explains this, talking about the sealing power of the temple and the priesthood, which is the name, the sealing power is the name of his talk. He says, without the sealings that create eternal families and link generations here and hereafter, we would be left in eternity with neither roots nor branches. Everything falls apart. That is, neither ancestry nor posterity. That is accomplished through a union of a man and a woman. He goes on to say, We can see why marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. And that's not all. President Oaks, in his talk, Kingdoms of Glory from October of 2023, says the following, God's plan, founded on eternal truth, requires that exaltation can be attained only through faithfulness to the covenants of an eternal marriage between a man and a woman in the holy temple, which marriage will ultimately be available to all the faithful. Right? That does not mean that the marriage will... that marriage will be available to other types of unions. It means that marriage between a man and a woman, this is exactly what he's saying, is available to all faithful, whether it's in this life or the life to come. That is why we teach that gender, he confirms it here, why gender is an essential characteristic of individual premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. A uniquely valuable teaching to help us prepare for exaltation is the 1995 Proclamation on the Family. Its declarations clarify the requirements that prepare us to live with God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Those who do not fully understand 
the father's loving plan uh, for his children may consider the family proclamation no more than a changeable statement of policy. This is what we're starting to get out there. In contrast, we affirm that the family proclamation founded on irrevocable doctrine defines the mortal family relationship where the most important part of our eternal development can occur. And lastly, the prophet himself, in a talk that is referenced all the time, but this part isn't brought up, where he's talking about thinking celestial, he brings up marriage between a man and a woman in regards to thinking celestial. He states here, the Lord has clearly taught that only men and women who are sealed as husband and wife in the temple and who keep their covenants will be together throughout the eternities. He said, all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise have an end when men are dead. So three different times, just in the last general conference, from the pulpit, the prophet, a member of the First Presidency, and an apostle, all confirm that the doctrine of the family is centered around the sealing of a man and a woman in the temple, that this is the focus as an ordinance to exaltation. So when we see these other things starting to happen, of course it's going to bring confusion. And it's not a bad thing to wonder why. But that big change is not going to happen. And what is so unfortunate is so many people out there who advocate for pride, push it all the way to the point of putting a hope in a change for the temple ceiling. And it moves you from a hope in Christ and his sacrifice and your suffering and, and your difficulties and putting that on the altar of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ over to putting your investment in a hope for change. It is moving from a hope in Christ to a hope in change. And that to me is really the issue here of who is really loving those individuals. Affirming something that is a non-truth is not helping anyone. Now, that doesn't mean that within the church, its membership, its leadership, etc., that these ideas and our cultural change is not going to seep in and grab a hold of a number of people. It already has. In fact, if I were to guess, just studying many other institutions, including other Christian denominations, this will come all the way to the porch of your front door, the front door of the church, the front door of the temple, and it's going to knock on that door. But it is not going to change. There is zero indication from the words of the prophets or anywhere in Scripture that that would change. So we can question and wonder and be confused about many other decisions that are going on. I think there's going to be a lot more of that. The question is, is can you walk the edge of the sword? I'm going to believe what the prophets say. I'm going to support them in that doctrine. They have asked for others to defend the doctrine of the family. I'm going to do that. I'm going to sustain them in their words. I can wonder about the rest. I can question about the rest. But I'm going to stick to what they say. And if you think that it is changing and they're going to change, what you're saying is that they are lying to the church, that they are actually blatantly lying to the church while behind the scenes they're planning on something else or preparing for something else. That's what you have to bite off on. For me... That's not going to happen. There's a lot of things that we don't understand why they happen. The church is a very big operation. And there are other reasons throughout the world why they make certain decisions. Sometimes they might seem concerning. Sometimes they are concerning. But at the end of the day, I'm going to follow the scriptures that I study regularly. 
and I'm going to follow the words of the prophets that are stated to the membership of the church. And I'm going to feel like I am on solid ground with two feet when I support the doctrine of the family. Talking about the doctrine of the family, supporting it as the rest of the Western world is breaking it apart, is not using it as a cudgel or a club. If the traditional family falls apart, civilization falls apart, the church falls apart, progress for all of us within the plan of salvation starts to fall apart. There's not a lot of warning voices out there or calling out what is happening. And and there must be good reason for that. I don't know what it is. My guess is eventually the confusion among the members of the church and many members of the church that are really struggling with this and many falling away because of these things and this concern about where this is heading I think eventually it's going to necessitate voices speaking directly to these issues. The doctrine of the family is an eternal principle. These doctrines, not the individuals, not the LGBTQ individuals, the ideology that is tied to identitarianism, critical theory and intersectionality, postmodernism, a lot of these things that have been pulled together here to give us what I call the religion of academia and this massive philosophical worldview change that we are going through right now is all based on secular ideas. And as the one who has probably seen our times better than anyone else recently, Elder Maxwell has stated, you have eternalism versus secularism. I want to go to a couple of his quotes here just to finish. He has a great talk that I've talked about a couple of times here uh, that speaks exactly to the problem that we are looking at here. Remember, in his time, some of these big issues had to do more with economic and what we call materialism, right? It was a communist type of an idea that we were worried about. Today, it is still a Marxian ideology that wraps all these things together. But it's not about economy necessarily. It's not about materialism necessarily. It's now about culture. And between eternalism and secularism, these are all secular ideas that are coming to us right now. He says there are significant differences involved in these two distinct approaches to the problems that confront man. And these differences have serious implications for the individual. Errant or random do-goodism Right? These ideologies play on people's hearts, on their empathy, and they use it as a carrot to bring them in. Errant or random do-goodism has so often been sincere, but has ended up being ineffective or is reminiscent of straightening deck chairs on the Titanic. That's what we're going through now. The wrong kind of help isn't really helpful. It is often harmful For solutions become problems. The actual solutions, like changing your hope, become the real problems, even bigger problems. He states, the new secular moral geometry, with its fluid lines, alien angles, and restless points, rejects the idea of divine design in the universe, like gender but then naively seeks to muster righteous indignation in behalf of the disadvantaged. This is critical theory. But without any corresponding concern over the need for non-economic morality or non-cultural morality, in other words, something beyond what is happening in the culture, a divine morality, the very values necessary to make indignation righteous. While there are often, as between eternalism and secularism, shared concerns, there is also a very sharp divergence in terms of the solutions proposed. Just remember that what you hear in the world today, in the West, in the United States, on these cultural changes and these ideologies, these are secular, and their solutions are secular. And then finally this, 
where reform and desirable change are concerned, eternalism opts for conditions that facilitate true individual growth. This is the key. This is the key. Letting the consequences of any successes ripple outward. Secularism tends to want to deal increasingly with systems, right? Systemic racism. Governments, right? Let's get the government to deal with this. Labels, that's intersectionality. Groups with adjustments in the things outside man. Like I've always stated, these ideologies want you to look at what is out there. The problem is always out there. It's not in you. This is, this is the same issue from the beginning of time. It has not changed. Move responsibility from yourself out to somebody else or another group. This is what critical social justice does. And if I take away my own repentance and my own issues of having to change then that means I don't need to lean on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I can just blame the systems, the government, ad labels, etc. There is a lot of confusion out there, and I don't know if it's going to get better. It's probably not. We do live in the last days, and secularism is spreading. Look at already the dissolution of the family, how many single parents there are out there, compared to just 25, 30 years ago and 30 years before that. Look at the increasing rise in secularism and the drop in religiosity. I think that our calling in the last days, as those who have received the truths of the restored gospel, is to walk the edge of the sword. We need to work harder at finding truth. That's not a bad calling. That is a calling asking us to progress more. That is a calling asking us to exert more faith. And when I say faith, I don't mean blind faith. I mean really searching and discovering truth. Listen to the prophets and read the scriptures and stick with those messages. Thanks for listening.